Hello friends, today I am reading class 11, chapter 5, Mother's Day by J. B. Priestley. The following play is a humorous portrayal of the status of the mother in a family. Let's read on to see how Mrs. Pearson's family reacts when she tries to stand up for her own rights. Characters Mrs. Annie Pearson, George Pearson, Doris Pearson, Cyril Pearson, Mrs. Fitzgerald. The action takes place in the living room of the Pearson's house in a London suburb. Time, the present. Scene, the living room of the Pearson family. Afternoon. It is a comfortably furnished, much lived in room in a small suburban semi detached villa. If necessary, only one door need be used, but it is better with two one up left, leading to the front door and the stairs, and the other in the right wall, leading to the kitchen and the back door. There can be a muslin covered window in the left wall and possibly one in the right wall too. The fireplace is assumed to be in the fourth wall. There is a settee upright, an armchair down left and one down right. A small table with two chairs on either side of it stands at the centre. When the curtain rises, it is an afternoon in early autumn and the stage can be well lit. Mrs. Pearson at right and Mrs. Fitzgerald at left are sitting opposite each other at the small table on which are two teacups and saucers and the cards with which Mrs. Fitzgerald has been telling Mrs. Pearson's fortune. Mrs. Pearson is a pleasant but worried-looking woman in her forties. Mrs. Fitzgerald is older, heavier, and a strong and sinister personality. She is smoking. It is very important that these two should have sharply contrasting voices. Mrs. Pearson speaking in a light, flurried sort of tone, with a touch of suburban cockney perhaps and Mrs. Fitzgerald, with a deep voice, rather Irish, perhaps. Mrs. Fitzgerald, collecting up the cards. And that's all I can tell you, Mrs. Pearson. Could be a good fortune, could be a bad one. All depends on yourself now. Make up your mind, and there it is. Mrs. Pearson, yes, thank you, Mrs. Fitzgerald. I'm much obliged, I'm sure. It's wonderful having a real fortune teller living next door. Did you learn that out east too? Mrs. Fitzgerald I did. Twelve years I had of it, with my old man rising to be lieutenant quartermaster. He learnt a lot and I learnt a lot more. But will you make up your mind now, Mrs. Pearson, dear? Put your foot down, once and for all and be the mistress of your own house and the boss of your own family. Mrs. Pearson, smiling apologetically. That's easier said than done. Besides, I'm so fond of them, even if they are so thoughtless and selfish. They don't mean to be. Mrs. Fitzgerald, cutting in. Maybe not. But it'd be better for them if they learned to treat you properly. Mrs. Pearson, Yes, I suppose it would, in a way. Mrs. Fitzgerald No doubt about it at all. Who's the better for being spoilt? Grown man, lad or girl? Nobody. You think it does them good when you run after them all the time? Take their orders as if you were the servant in the house? Stay at home every night while they go out enjoying themselves? Never in all your life. It's the ruin of them as well as you. Husbands, sons, daughters, 
should be taking notice of wives and mothers, not giving them orders and treating them like dirt. And don't tell me you don't know what I mean, for I know more than you have told me. Mrs. Pearson, dubiously, I keep dropping a hint. Mrs. Fitzgerald, hint? It's more than hints your family needs, Mrs. Pearson. Mrs. Pearson, dubiously, I suppose it is, but I do hate any unpleasantness, and it's so hard to know where to start. I keep making up my mind to have it out with them, but somehow I don't know how to begin. She glances at her watch, or at a clock. Oh, good gracious, look at the time. Nothing ready, and they'll be home any minute, and probably all in a hurry to go out again. As she is about to rise, Mrs. Fitzgerald reaches out across the table and pulls her down. Mrs. Fitzgerald Let him wait, or look after themselves for once. This is where your foot goes down. Start now. She lights a cigarette from the one she has just finished. Mrs. Pearson, embarrassed. Mrs. Fitzgerald, I know you mean well. In fact, I agree with you. But I just can't. And it's no use you trying to make me. If I promise you, I'd really have it out with them. I know I wouldn't be able to keep my promise. Mrs. Fitzgerald, then let me do it. Mrs. Pearson, flustered. Oh no, thank you very much, Mrs. Fitzgerald. But that wouldn't do at all. It couldn't possibly be somebody else. They'd resent it at once and wouldn't listen. And really, I couldn't blame them. I know I ought to do it. But you see how it is. She looks apologetically across the table, smiling rather miserably. Mrs. Fitzgerald, coolly. You haven't got the idea. Mrs. Pearson, bewildered. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you asked me to let you do it. Mrs. Fitzgerald, I did, but not as me, as you. Mrs. Pearson, but I don't understand. You couldn't be me. Mrs. Fitzgerald, coolly. We change places, or really bodies. You look like me, I look like you. Mrs. Pearson, but that's impossible. Mrs. Fitzgerald, how do you know? Ever tried it? Mrs. Pearson, no, of course not. Mrs. Fitzgerald, coolly, I have. Not for some time, but it still ought to work. Won't last long, but long enough for what we want to do. Learn it out east, of course, where they are up to all these tricks. She holds her hand out across the table, keeping the cigarette in her mouth. Give me your hands, dear. Mrs. Pearson, dubiously. Well, I don't know. Is it right? Mrs. Fitzgerald. It's your only chance. Give me your hands and keep quiet a minute. Just don't think about anything. Taking her hands. Now look at me. They stare at each other, muttering. Arshtata dum, arshtata lum, arshtata lum dum bona. This little scene should be acted very carefully. We are to assume that the personalities change bodies. After the spell has been spoken, both women, still grasping hands, go lax, as if the life were out of them. Then both come to life, but with the personality of the other. Each must try to adopt the voice and mannerisms of the other. So now, Mrs. Pearson is bold and dominating, and Mrs. Fitzgerald is nervous and fluttering. Mrs. Pearson, now with Mrs. Fitzgerald's personality. See what I mean, dear? She notices the cigarette. Here, you don't want that. She snatches it and puts it in her own mouth, puffing contentedly. Mrs. Fitzgerald, now with Mrs. Pearson's personality, looking down at herself, and sees that her body has changed and gives a scream of fright. 
Mrs. Fitzgerald, with Mrs. Pearson's personality. Oh, it's happened, Mrs. Pearson, complacently. Of course it's happened. Very neat. Didn't know I had it in me. Mrs. Fitzgerald, alarmed. But whatever shall I do, Mrs. Fitzgerald? George and the children can't see me like this. Mrs. Pearson, grimly. They aren't going to. That's the point. They'll have me to deal with. Only they won't know it. Mrs. Fitzgerald, still alarmed. But what if we can't change back? It'd be terrible. Mrs. Pearson. Here, steady, Mrs. Pearson. If you had to live my life, it wouldn't be so bad. You'd have more fun as me than you've had as you. Mrs. Fitzgerald. Yes, but I don't want to be anybody else. Mrs. Pearson. Now, stop worrying. It's easier changing back. I can do it any time we want. Mrs. Fitzgerald. Well, do it now. Mrs. Pearson. Not likely. I've got to deal with your family first. That's the idea, isn't it? Didn't know how to begin with them, you said. Well, I'll show you. Mrs. Fitzgerald. But what am I going to do? Mrs. Pearson. Go into my house for a bit. There's nobody there. Then pop back and see how we're doing. You ought to enjoy it. Better get off now before one of them comes. Mrs. Fitzgerald, nervously rising. Yes, I suppose that's best. You're sure it'll be all right? Mrs. Pearson, chuckling. It'll be wonderful. Now off you go, dear. Mrs. Fitzgerald crosses and hurries out through the door right. Left to herself, Mrs. Pearson smokes away lighting another cigarette and begins laying out the cards for patience on the table. After a few moments, Doris Pearson comes bursting in left. She is a pretty girl in her early twenties who would be pleasant enough if she had not been spoilt. Doris, before she has taken anything in. Mum, you'll have to iron my yellow silk. I must wear it tonight. She now sees what is happening and is astounded. What are you doing? She moves down left center. Mrs. Pearson now uses her ordinary voice, but her manner is not fluttering and apologetic, but cool and incisive. Mrs. Pearson, not even looking up. What do you think I'm doing? Whitewashing the ceiling? Doris, still astounded. But you're smoking, Mrs. Pearson. That's right, dear. No law against it, is there? Doris. But I thought you didn't smoke, Mrs. Pearson. Then you thought wrong. Doris. Are we having tea in the kitchen? Mrs. Pearson. Have it where you like, dear. Doris, angrily. Do you mean it isn't ready? Mrs. Pearson. Yours isn't. I've had all I want. Might go out later and get a square meal at the Clarendon. Doris, hardly believing her ears. Who might? Mrs. Pearson. I might. Who do you think? Doris, staring at her. Mum, what's the matter with you? Mrs. Pearson. Don't be silly. Doris, indignantly. It's not me that's being silly. And I must say, it's a bit much when I've been working hard all day and you can't even bother to get my tea ready. Did you hear what I said about my yellow silk? Mrs. Pearson, no. Don't you like it now? I never did. Doris, indignantly. Of course I like it. And I'm going to wear it tonight, so I want it ironed. Mrs. Pearson. Want it ironed? What did you think it's going to do? Iron itself? Doris. No, you're going to iron it for me. You always do 
Mrs. Pearson. Well, this time I don't. And don't talk rubbish to me about working hard. I have a good idea how much you do, Doris Pearson. I put in twice the hours you do and get no wages nor thanks for it. Why are you going to wear your yellow silk? Where are you going? Doris Pearson, sulkily. Out with Charlie Spence. Mrs. Pearson, why? Doris, wildly. Why? Why? What's the matter with you? Why shouldn't I go out with Charlie Spence if he asks me and I want to? Any objections? Go on. You might as well tell me. Mrs. Pearson, severely. Can't you find anybody better? I wouldn't be seen dead with Charlie Spence, buck teeth and half-witted. Doris, he isn't. Mrs. Pearson, when I was your age, I'd have found somebody better than Charlie Spence or given myself up as a bad job. Doris, nearly in tears. Oh, shut up! Doris runs out left. Mrs. Pearson chuckles and begins putting the cards together. After a moment, Cyril Pearson enters left. He is the masculine counterpart of Doris. Cyril, briskly. Hello, Mum. Tea ready? Mrs. Pearson. No. Cyril, moving to the table, annoyed. Why not? Mrs. Pearson, coolly. I couldn't bother. Cyril, feeling off color or something? Mrs. Pearson, never felt better in my life. Cyril, aggressively. What's the idea then? Mrs. Pearson, just a change. Cyril, briskly. Well, snap out of it, ma, and get cracking. Haven't too much time. Cyril is about to go when Mrs. Pearson's voice checks him. Mrs. Pearson, I have plenty of time. Cyril, yes, but I haven't. Got a busy night tonight, moving left to the door. Did you put my things out? Mrs. Pearson, coolly. Can't remember, but I doubt it. Cyril, moving to the table, protesting. Now look! When I asked you this morning, you promised. You said you'd have to look through them first, in case there was any mending. Mrs. Pearson. Yes. Well, now I've decided I don't like mending. Cyril. That's a nice way to talk. What would happen if we all talked like that? Mrs. Pearson. You all do talk like that. If there's something at home you don't want to do, you don't do it. If it's something at your work... You get the union to bar it. Now all that's happened is that I've joined the movement. Cyril staggered. I don't get this, Mum. What's going on? Mrs. Pearson, laconic and sinister. Changes. Doris enters left. She is in the process of dressing and is now wearing a wrap. She looks pale and red-eyed. Mrs. Pearson. You look terrible. I wouldn't wear that face even for Charlie Spence. Doris, moving above the table, angrily. Oh, shut up about Charlie Spence. And anyhow, I'm not ready yet, just dressing. And if I do look terrible, it's your fault. You made me cry. Cyril, curious. Why? What did she do? Doris, never you mind. Mrs. Pearson. Rising and preparing to move to the kitchen. Have we any stout left? I can't remember. Cyril. Bottle or two, I think. But you don't want stout now. Mrs. Pearson. Moving left slowly. I do. Cyril. What for? Mrs. Pearson. Turning at the door. To drink, you clot. Mrs. Pearson exits right. Instantly, Cyril and Doris are in a huddle, close together at left center, rapidly whispering. Doris, has she been like that with you too? Cyril, yes, no tea ready, couldn't care less. Doris, well, I'm glad it's both of us. I thought I'd done something wrong. Cyril, so did I. But it's her, of course. Doris, Doris, 
She was smoking and playing cards when I came in. I couldn't believe my eyes. Cyril. I asked her if she was feeling off color and she said she wasn't. Doris. Well, she's suddenly all different. And that's what made me cry. It wasn't what she said, but the way she said it and the way she looked. Cyril. Haven't noticed that. She looks just the same to me. Doris. She doesn't to me. Do you think she could have hit her head or something? You know, and got, uh, what is it, you know? Cyril staggered. Do you mean she's balmy? Doris. No, you fathead. You know, concussion. She might have. Cyril. Sounds far-fetched. Doris. Well, she's far-fetched, if you ask me. She suddenly begins to giggle. Cyril. Now then, what is it? Doris. If she is going to be like this when dad comes home, she giggles again. Cyril begins to guffaw. I am staying in for that. Two front dress circles for the first house. Mrs. Pearson enters right, carrying a bottle of stout and a half-filled glass. Cyril and Doris try to stop their guffawing and giggling, but they are not quick enough. Mrs. Pearson regards them with contempt. Mrs. Pearson, coldly, You two are always talking about being grown up. Why don't you both try for once to be your age? She moves to the settee and sits. Cyril, can't we laugh now? Mrs. Pearson, yes, if it's funny, go on, tell me. Make me laugh. I could do with it. Doris, you know, you never understand our jokes, Mum. Mrs. Pearson, I was yawning at your jokes before you were born, Doris. Doris, almost tearful again. What's making you talk like this? What have we done? Mrs. Pearson, promptly. Nothing but come in, ask for something, go out again, then come back when there's nowhere else to go. Cyril, aggressively, look. If you won't get tea ready, then I'll find something to eat myself. Mrs. Pearson, why not? Help yourself. She takes a sip of stout. Cyril, turning on his way to the kitchen. Mind you, I think it's a bit thick. I've been working all day. Doris, same here. Mrs. Pearson, calmly. Eight hour day. Cyril, yes, eight hour day. And don't forget it. Mrs. Pearson, I've done my eight hours. Cyril, that's different. Doris, of course it is. Mrs. Pearson, calmly. It was, now it isn't. Forty hour week for all now. Just watch it at the weekend when I have my two days off. Doris and Cyril exchange alarmed glances. Then they stare at Mrs. Pearson, who returns their look calmly. Cyril, must grab something to eat. Looks as if I'll need to keep my strength up. Cyril exits to the kitchen. Doris, moving to the settee anxiously. Mummy, you don't mean you're not going to do anything on Saturday and Sunday? Mrs. Pearson, airily. No, I wouldn't go that far. I might make a bed or two and do a bit of cooking as a favour, which means, of course, I'll have to be asked very nicely and thanked for everything and generally made a fuss of. But any of you, 40 hours a weeker, who expects to be waited on hand and foot on Saturday and Sunday with no thanks for it, are in for a nasty disappointment. Might go off for the weekend, perhaps. Doris, aghast. Go off for the weekend? Mrs. Pearson, why not? I could do with a change. Stuck here day after day, week after week. If I don't need a change, who does? Doris, but where would you go? Who would you go with? Mrs. Pearson, that's my business. You don't ask me where you should go and who you should go with, do you? Doris, that's different.
Mrs. Pearson. The only difference is that I'm a lot older and better able to look after myself. So it's you who should do the asking. Doris. Did you fall or hit yourself with something? Mrs. Pearson. Coldly. No. But I'll hit you with something, girl, if you don't stop asking silly questions. Doris stares at her, open-mouthed, ready to cry. Doris. Oh, this is awful. She begins to cry, not passionately. Mrs. Pearson, coldly. Stop blubbering. You're not a baby. If you're old enough to go out with Charlie Spence, you're old enough to behave properly. Now stop it. George Pearson enters left. He is about 50. Fundamentally decent, but solemn. Self-important, pompous. Preferably, he should be a heavy, slow-moving type. He notices Doris's tears. George. Hello, what's this? Can't be anything to cry about. Can't be anything to cry about. Doris, through sobs. You'll see. Doris runs out left with a sob or two on the way. George stares after her a moment. Then looks at Mrs. Pearson. George. Did she say you'll see? Mrs. Pearson. Yes. George. What did she mean? Mrs. Pearson. Better ask her. George looks slowly again at the door and then at Mrs. Pearson. Then he notices the stout that Mrs. Pearson raises for another sip. His eyes almost bulge. George. Stout? Mrs. Pearson. Yes. George. Amazed. What are you drinking stout for? Mrs. Pearson. Because I fancied some. George. At this time of day? Mrs. Pearson. Yes. What's wrong with it at this time of day? George. Bewildered. Nothing, I suppose. Annie, I've never seen you do it before. Mrs. Pearson. Well, you're seeing me now. George. With heavy distaste. Yes. And I don't like it. It doesn't look right. I'm surprised at you. Mrs. Pearson. Well, that ought to be a nice change for you. George. What do you mean? Mrs. Pearson. It must be some time since you were surprised at me, George. George. I don't like surprises. I'm all for a steady going on. You ought to know that by this time. By the way, I forgot to tell you this morning. I wouldn't want any tea. Special snooker match night at the club tonight. And a bit of supper going, so no tea. Mrs. Pearson. That's all right. There isn't any. George, astonished. You mean you didn't get any ready? Mrs. Pearson. Yes, and a good thing too, as it's turned out. George, aggrieved. That's all very well, but suppose I'd wanted some? Mrs. Pearson. My goodness, listen to the man. Annoyed because I don't get a tea for him that he doesn't even want. Ever tried that at the club? George. Tried what at the club? Mrs. Pearson. Going up to the bar and telling him you don't want a glass of beer, but you're annoyed because they haven't already poured it out. Try that on them and see what you get. George. I don't know what you're talking about. Mrs. Pearson. They'd laugh at you even more than they do now. George, indignantly. Laugh at me? They don't laugh at me. Mrs. Pearson. Of course they do. You ought to have found that out by this time. Anybody else would have done. You're one of their standing jokes. Famous. They call you Pompey Ompey Pearson because they think you're so slow and pompous. George, horrified. Never. Mrs. Pearson. It's always beaten me why you should want to spend so much time at a place where they're always laughing at you behind your back and calling you names. Leaving your wife at home night after night instead of going out with her. Who doesn't make you look a fool?
Cyril enters right with a glass of milk in one hand and a thick slice of cake in the other. George, almost dazed, turns to him appealingly. George, here Cyril, you've been with me to the club once or twice. They don't laugh at me and call me Pompey Ompey Pearson, do they? Cyril, embarrassed, hesitates, angrily. Go on, tell me, do they? Cyril, embarrassed. Well, yes, Dad, I'm afraid they do. George slowly looks from one to the other, staggered. George, slowly. Well, I'll be damned. George exits left, slowly. Almost as if somebody had hit him over the head. Cyril, after watching him go, turns indignantly to Mrs. Pearson. Cyril. Now, you shouldn't have told him that, Mum. That's not fair. You've hurt his feelings. Mine too, Mrs. Pearson. Sometimes it does people good to have their feelings hurt. The truth ought not to hurt anybody for long. If your father didn't go to the club so often, perhaps they'd stop laughing at him. Cyril, gloomingly, I doubt it. Mrs. Pearson, severely, Possibly you do, but what I doubt is whether your opinion's worth having. What do you know? Nothing. You spend too much time and good money at greyhound races and dirt tracks and ice shows. Cyril, sulkily. Well, what if I do? I've got to enjoy myself somehow, haven't I? Mrs. Pearson. I wouldn't mind so much if you were really enjoying yourself, but are you? And where is it getting you? There is a sharp, hurried knocking, heard off left. Cyril. Might be for me. I'll see. Cyril hurries out left. In a moment, he re-enters, closing the door behind him. It's that silly old bag from next door, Mrs. Fitzgerald. You don't want her here, do you? Mrs. Pearson, sharply. Certainly I do. Ask her in. And don't call her a silly old bag either. She's a very nice woman, with a lot more sense than you'll ever have. Cyril exits left. Mrs. Pearson finishes her stout, smacking her lips. Cyril re-enters left, ushering in Mrs. Fitzgerald, who hesitates in the doorway. Come in, come in, Mrs. Fitzgerald. Mrs. Fitzgerald, moving to left center, anxiously, I just wondered if everything's all right. Cyril, sulkily, no, it isn't. Mrs. Pearson, sharply, of course it is. You be quiet. Cyril, indignantly and loudly, why should I be quiet? Mrs. Pearson, shouting, because I tell you to, you silly, spoilt young pikin. Mrs. Fitzgerald, protesting nervously. Oh, no, surely, Mrs. Pearson, severely. Now, Mrs. Fitzgerald, just let me manage my family in my own way, please. Mrs. Fitzgerald, yes, but Cyril. Cyril, sulky and glowering. Mr. Cyril Pearson to you, please, Mrs. Fitzgerald. Cyril stalks off into the kitchen. Mrs. Fitzgerald, moving to the settee, whispering. Oh dear, what's happening? Mrs. Pearson, calmly. Nothing much. Just putting them in their places, that's all. Doing what you ought to have done long since. Mrs. Fitzgerald. Is George home? She sits beside Mrs. Pearson on the settee. Mrs. Pearson. Yes, I've been telling him what they think of him at the club. Mrs. Fitzgerald. Well... They think a lot of him, don't they? Mrs. Pearson. No, they don't. And now he knows it. Mrs. Fitzgerald, nervously. Oh dear, I wish you hadn't, Mrs. Fitzgerald. Mrs. Pearson. Nonsense. Doing them all a world of good. And they'll be eating out of your hand soon, you'll see. Mrs. Fitzgerald. I don't think I want them eating out of my hand. Mrs. Pearson, impatiently. Well, whatever you want, they'll be doing it, all three of them. Mark my words, Mrs. Pearson.
George enters left glumly. He is unpleasantly surprised when he sees the visitor. He moves to the armchair left, sits down heavily and glumly lights his pipe. Then he looks from Mrs. Pearson to Mrs. Fitzgerald, who is regarding him anxiously. George, just looked in for a minute, I suppose, Mrs. Fitzgerald. Mrs. Fitzgerald, who doesn't know what she is saying. Well, yes, I suppose so, George. George, aghast. George? Mrs. Fitzgerald, nervously. Oh, I'm sorry. Mrs. Pearson, impatiently. What does it matter? Your name's George, isn't it? Who did you think you are? Duke of Edinburgh? George, angrily. What's he got to do with it? Just tell me that. And isn't it bad enough without her calling me George? No tea, Pompey Ompey Pearson. And poor Doris has been crying her eyes out upstairs. Yes, crying her eyes out. Mrs. Fitzgerald, wailing. Oh dear, I ought to have known. George, staring at her, annoyed. You ought to have known? Why ought you to have known? Nothing to do with you, Mrs. Fitzgerald. Look, we are at sixes and sevens here just now, so perhaps you'll excuse us, Mrs. Pearson, before Mrs. Fitzgerald can reply. I won't excuse you, George Pearson. Next time a friend and neighbor comes to see me, just say something when you see her, good evening or how do you do, or something, and don't just march in and sit down without a word. It's bad manners. Mrs. Fitzgerald, nervously. No, it's all right. Mrs. Pearson. No, it isn't all right. We'll have some decent manners in this house. Or I'll know the reason why. Glaring at George. Well? George, intimidated. Well, what? Mrs. Pearson, taunting him. Why don't you get off to your club? Special night tonight, isn't it? They'll be waiting for you, wanting to have a good laugh. Go on then, don't disappoint him. George, bitterly. That's right. Make me look silly in front of her now. Go on, don't mind me. Sixes and sevens. Poor Doris, been crying her eyes out, getting the neighbors in to see the fun. Suddenly losing his temper, glaring at Mrs. Pearson and shouting. All right. Let her hear it. What's the matter with you? Have you gone balmy or what? Mrs. Pearson, jumping up savagely. If you shout at me again like that, George Pearson, I'll slap your big, fat, silly face. Mrs. Fitzgerald, moaning. Oh, no, 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 please, Mrs. Fitzgerald. Mrs. Pearson sits. George, staring at her, bewildered. Either I'm off my chump, or you two are. How did you mean, no, no, please, Mrs. Fitzgerald? Look. You're Mrs. Fitzgerald. So why are you telling yourself to stop when you're not doing anything? Tell her to stop. Then there'd be some sense in it. Staring at Mrs. Pearson. I think you must be tiddly. Mrs. Pearson. Starting up savagely. Say that again, George Pearson. George. Intimidated. All right, all right, all right. Doris enters left slowly looking miserable. She is still wearing the wrap. Mrs. Pearson sits on the settee. Mrs. Fitzgerald. Hello, Doris, dear. Doris, miserably. Hello, Mrs. Fitzgerald. Mrs. Fitzgerald. I thought you were going out with Charlie Spence tonight. Doris, annoyed. What's that to do with you? Mrs. Pearson, sharply. Stop that. Mrs. Fitzgerald, nervously. No, it's all right. Mrs. Pearson, severely. It isn't all right. I won't have a daughter of mine talking to anybody like that. Now, answer Mrs. Fitzgerald properly, Doris, or go upstairs again. Doris looks wonderingly at her father. George, in despair. Don't look at me. I give it up. I just give it up. Mrs. Pearson, fiercely. Well... Answer her. Doris, sulkily. 
I was going out with Charlie Spence tonight, but now I've called it off. Mrs. Fitzgerald. Oh, what a pity, dear. Why have you? Doris, with a flash of temper. Because, if you must know, my mother's been going on at me, making me feel miserable and saying he's got buck teeth and is half-witted. Mrs. Fitzgerald, rather bolder to Mrs. Pearson. Oh, you shouldn't have said that. Mrs. Pearson, sharply. Mrs. Fitzgerald, I'll manage my family, you manage yours. George, grimly. Ticking her off now, are you, Annie? Mrs. Pearson, even more grimly. They're waiting for you at the club, George. Don't forget. And don't you start crying again, Doris. Mrs. Fitzgerald, getting up with sudden decision. That's enough, quite enough. George and Doris stare at her, bewildered. To George and Doris. Now listen, you two. I want to have a private little talk with Mrs. Fitz. She corrects herself hastily. With Mrs. Pearson. So I'll be obliged if you'll leave us alone for a few minutes. I'll let you know when we've finished. Go on, please. I promise you that you won't regret it. There's something here that only I can deal with. George, rising. I'm glad somebody can, because I can't. Come on, Doris. George and Doris exit left. As they go, Mrs. Fitzgerald moves to left of the small table and sits. She eagerly beckons Mrs. Pearson to do the same thing. Mrs. Fitzgerald. Mrs. Fitzgerald, we must change back now. We really must. Mrs. Pearson. Rising. Why? Mrs. Fitzgerald. Because this has gone far enough. I can see they're all miserable and I can't bear it. Mrs. Pearson. A bit more of the same would do em good. Making a great difference already. She moves to right of the table and sits. Mrs. Fitzgerald. No, I can't stand any more of it. I really can't. We must change back. Hurry up, please, Mrs. Fitzgerald. Mrs. Pearson. Well, if you insist. Mrs. Fitzgerald. Yes, I do. Please, please. She stretches her hand across the table eagerly. Mrs. Pearson takes them. Mrs. Pearson. Quiet now. Relax. Mrs. Pearson and Mrs. Fitzgerald stare at each other, muttering exactly as before. Ashatadam, Ashatalam, Ashatalam Dambona. They carry out the same action as before, going lax and then coming to life. But this time, of course, they become their proper personalities. Mrs. Fitzgerald. Ah, well, I enjoyed that. Mrs. Pearson. I didn't. Mrs. Fitzgerald. Well, you ought to have done. Now, listen, Mrs. Pearson. Don't go soft on him again, else it'll all have been wasted. Mrs. Pearson. I'll try not to, Mrs. Fitzgerald. Mrs. Fitzgerald. They've not had as long as I'd like to have given him. Another hour or two's rough treatment might have made it certain. Mrs. Pearson. I'm sure they'll do better now, though I don't know how I'm going to explain. Mrs. Fitzgerald. Severely. Don't you start any explaining or apologizing, or you're done for. Mrs. Pearson, with spirit. It's all right for you, Mrs. Fitzgerald. After all, they aren't your husband and children. Mrs. Fitzgerald, impressively. Now you listen to me. You admitted yourself you were spoiling him, and they didn't appreciate you. Any apologies, any explanations, and you'll be straight back where you were. I'm warning you, dear. Just give him a look, a tone of voice, now and again, to suggest you might be tough with them if you wanted to be. And it ought to work. Anyhow, we can test it. Mrs. Pearson. How? Mrs. Fitzgerald. Well, what is it you'd like him to do that they don't do? Stop at home for once? Mrs. Pearson. Yes. And give me a hand with supper. Mrs. Fitzgerald. Anything you'd like him to do 
that you enjoy, whether they do or not? Mrs. Pearson, hesitating. Well, yes, I like a nice game of rummy, but of course I hardly ever have one, except at Christmas. Mrs. Fitzgerald, getting up. That'll do then. She moves towards the door left, then turns. But remember, keep firm, or you've had it. She opens the door, calling. Hoy! You can come in now. Coming away from the door and moving right slightly, quietly. But remember, remember a firm hand. George, Doris and Cyril file in through the doorway, looking apprehensively at Mrs. Pearson. I'm just off to let you enjoy yourself. The family looks anxiously at Mrs. Pearson, who smiles. Much relieved, they smile back at her. Doris, anxiously. Yes, mother? Mrs. Pearson, smiling. Seeing that you don't want to go out, I tell you what I thought we'd do. Mrs. Fitzgerald, giving a final warning. Remember. Mrs. Pearson, nodding, then looking sharply at the family. No objections, I hope. George, humbly. No, mother, whatever you say. Mrs. Pearson, smiling. I thought we'd have a nice family game of rummy, and then you children could get the supper ready while I have a talk with your father. George, firmly, suits me. He looks challengingly at the children. What about you two? Cyril, hastily, yes, that's all right. Doris, hesitatingly, well, I... Mrs. Pearson, sharply, what? Speak up. Doris, hastily. Oh, I think it would be lovely. Mrs. Pearson, smiling. Goodbye, Mrs. Fitzgerald. Come again soon. Mrs. Fitzgerald. Yes, dear. Night all. Have a nice time. Mrs. Fitzgerald exits left, and the family cluster round mother as the curtain falls. So, friends... If you know someone who will benefit from these videos, kindly share it with them. Like the video and also subscribe to the channel so that you never miss any more videos from this channel. And thanks for listening.